Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Meet the Minds, Australian Marsupials, the right kind of boring. I'm Chantelle Crossman, Partnerships Manager in the Office of Communication, Marketing and Engagement, and I'm excited to host today's event as we explore what makes koalas, kangaroos, bilbies and other marsupials so unique, why they have been falsely labelled as boring by generations of scientists, how they can help us answer key questions about ma mammal biodiversity, and what the future might hold for our iconic Aussie mammals. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people and that we pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all nations upon which Flinders operates. This event is delivered as part of our Meet the Minds lunchtime lecture series where you will meet some of Flinders University's most engaging minds as they bring you their research from a diverse range of fields. Today, we're fortunate to be hearing from Associate Professor Vera Weisbecker. Dr Weisbecker is an Associate Professor, professor in Evolutionary Biology and Head of the Morphological Evo Devo Lab at Flinders University. Her research lab investigates diversity patterns and adaptations in vertebrates, um, particularly marsupials, such as wombats, kangaroos and Tassie devils. She works on all aspects of marsupial form and, bio and diversity, from development to brains to adaptations that might help them survive future change. Her research includes analyses on how the development of the marsupial body can explain, how rules of, can explain the rules of how mammals have come to rule the land. Her current work is most focused on using 3D analysis to investigate if marsupials are limited in their more intimate lifetime or population level ability to adapt to changing environments. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event with live Q&A session. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions to the speakers in real time. However, we do ask that everyone please treat this forum as a place of respectful engagement where people are treated with diverse um, dignity and where differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving questions now via the message um, function on this platform. And so now it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Vera, Vera Weisbecker. Thank you very much, Vera. Thanks, Chantelle, and thank you very much for tuning in to me trying to fit my interest into Australian marsupials into 15 minutes. I'll see how I go. So, um, yeah, as Chantelle already said, I'm really interested in the rules that govern mammalian diversity at sort of all levels of organisation. And I have been working on Australian marsupials for the last uh, roughly 20 years. And still when I go to an international conference or when I talk to my Northern Hemisphere colleagues, there is often this idea that marsupials are somehow primitive, boring, not really worth studying, not really a proper mammal. And I'm hoping to debunk this um, hypothesis or these ideas today to you. Um, for those of you who don't know marsupial mammals, I'm on, ah, here we go, very sorry. Um, the slide wasn't changing. So this is this is some of the marsupials that we have in Australia. Australia is a really unique country in the sense that it has nearly all of its native mammals as marsupials. So only Australian bats and Australian rodents are not um, marsupials. Everything else, nearly everything else is marsupials. And you will know them from some iconic species such as our kangaroos, uh, koalas, the um, Thalassina Tasmanian tiger was also a marsupial. And we also have some really bizarre animals that are less commonly known, such as the marsupial mole in the bottom right, which um, has no eyes left and these bizarre claws. So clearly not a boring group of mammals, um, but not everyone thinks of it that way. Now, the reason why marsupials are so important for understanding mammalian evolution needs to uh, take a step back into looking at them in the context of mammals as a whole, which really is comprised of three main groups. And the groups that we belong to as humans and that people are most familiar with is what we call the placental mammals. They're called placentals because they are pregnant for a very long time with a placenta, which marsupials also have, but not quite for as long, just as a disclaimer. So um, placental mammals are what we think about when we think about mammalian evolution. They come in lots of different sizes from, you know, a little two gram shrew to something like a 180 ton blue whale. They have really strange adaptations such as active flight and wings and also um, flippers or hooves. 
all things that are really quite unusual for a vertebrate animal to have. So to understand where this diversity comes from, one of the things that's really important is to understand the background of this body plan. And you can't just do that by looking at one group of mammals. You have to look at several. There are two candidate groups for this in Australia, and I briefly want to give some credit to the monotremes, which are egg-laying mammals and not marsupials. Um, they're the echidnas and the platypus that you're probably familiar with, but there's only two of them or two types of them. There's the echidna-like ones and there's the platypus, so you can't really do a quantitative analysis of them. And they're also very, very strange as a group of animals, so it's very hard to use them as a comparison to placental mammals. But then when we look at Australian marsupials in particular, and also the American species, we see a group that is really quite different in its patterning. So it's got a few less species. It's got roughly 360, 370 species, whereas placental mammals have roughly 4,000. And so they also don't have the same types of specializations that placental mammals have. They don't have active flight. They do have some gliders. They don't have fully aquatic water living forms like whales. They do have a semi-aquatic water opossum though. And, but then on the other hand, we have things like kangaroos, which are the largest mammals to ever hop and whose skeleton has to function very close to the safety factors of bone that pretty much nearly break every time a kangaroo takes a hop. So they're a really good group to understand what drives the diversity patterns of mammals. The problem is they've been designated as boring for the last roughly 200 years. The earliest reference I've been finding on this is from 1837. And there is a very specific reason why marsupials are thought to be boring and somehow constrained in their ability to adapt. And I can't help but show you a little video regarding this because it is just so awesome. So what you're going to see here is the birth process of a Tasmanian devil, which has roughly 37, 39-ish embryos of which four make it to the teat. And this is how they do it. They're born the size of a rice grain. So these little things you can see here are really, really tiny. Um, and you can see how they're actively moving towards the teat area. So they're using their forelimbs um, and later they will use the jaws and their big bulbous heads, which you can see here, to attach to the teat. And mum just sits there. She does nothing, despite the fact that the babies are so very tiny. And marsupials have had this mode of birth in some form for the last 60 million years, which is when the last common ancestor of marsupials lived. So you can imagine that this is a really extreme way of being born. It is something that we don't see in any other um, land vertebrates. And very early in the piece, scientists have thought that this must imprint itself so much on the marsupial body that it's basically got no hope of ever doing anything interesting. What they didn't quite realize is that this mode of reproduction itself is incredibly interesting and holds a lot of answers for mammalian evolution as a whole. And this is where I started off when I began my PhD back in the mid 2000s. I started doing some relatively new technique of micro CT scanning, which is where you essentially use X-rays to visualize the skeletal features inside of an animal's body. And so this picture here is of a museum specimen of a newborn possum, and you can see that on the left is its head and it's got these big jaws with lots of white bone in them. And then the forelimb and the torso also has a lot of bone in it, which is understandable because these are the bits that have to function when the baby is born. It seems like this process also kind of sucks the energy out of the rest of the body so that um, we have this acceleration or strong development of the jaw and of the uh, forelimb, but we have a delay in the brain and also the hind limb. This hind limb delay may be the reason why kangaroos have evolved, but we're not quite sure about this yet. But overall, there's this idea that this is a really unusual way of developing that somehow can't be as good as the Northern Hemisphere placental way. So one of the hypotheses I've been working on in my um, research is whether this mode of development is actually developmentally primitive. Um, also, whether this delay of brain development actually translates into small or primitive um, brains and brain sizes. And also maybe more pertinently for today, whether marsupials are actually incapable of adapting to new and different environments because their skeleton and their skull in particular isn't able to adapt very quickly because of this constraint of having to go to the teat at birth in every single instance of birth. 
So going back to the first question of whether marsupials are developmentally primitive. So one of the things I did was I took micro CT scans and X-rays of a lot of mammalian species, including marsupials, but also comparing them to these two other groups of mammals, the placental mammals and the monotremes. And when you compare the skeletons of sort of very broadly similar developmental stages, you can see at the top the forelimb area where all three animals have a bit of bone. But then, so this is not unusual, only the marsupial have very, has very large forelimbs. But then when you look at the hind limb area, the, the back of the body, you can see that in placentals, um, this is an armadillo in this case, there is a lot of bone in the hind limb. And there is also a fair bit of bone in the hind limb of the monotremes. The only, marsu the, the only mammal that doesn't have bone at such an early stage in its hind limb is a marsupial. So this establishes that this dichotomy between the front and the back end of marsupials is not something that's primitive at all. It's actually something that marsupials sort of came up with. There is no other vertebrate, um, no frog, no lizard, no bird that does it like this. So marsupials are not primitive. They're the actual opposite of primitive. And this makes them super interesting for understanding how development impacts on the evolution of the mammalian form and diversity. So Moving on to the next question of whether marsupials have small and primitive brains, I think that prejudice is partly because they, their brain is developmentally very late compared to the rest of the body, but also um, the model organism, the scientific model organism for marsupials has for many years been the Virginia opossum, which happens to be one of the most small brained marsupials. So really they came off to a bad start. Um, and I've been working on brain size and relative brain size relative to body size for many years. And I think this graph here probably captures the story best. So we've got different groups of marsupials in red and different groups of placentals on the right there. And when you sort of break marsupial relative brain sizes down, you can see that most marsupials are under or just on the value of one, where a value of one means that you have exactly the kind of brain size that would be expected for your body mass. But when you look at the placental mammals or most groups of placental mammals, things like um, my little goats, these are actually mine, um, and um, sort of generalized mammals, they are also coming out as below one, so relatively small brained relative to their body mass. But then when you look at some groups of mammals, such as these purple points on the top there, you can, these are the cetaceans, the toothed whales, such as orcas and dolphins, they have very large relative brain sizes. And also inside this uh, group of Euacontogliris, this contains the primates. And when you take the primates out, which is humans and other apes, uh, this yellow group, goes from relatively very large brain back to just under one as well. So what I'm trying to say is here that um, placental mammals have very similar brain size baselines. They are not systematically larger brain than marsupials, but they have somehow managed to produce several single very large brain um, radiation. So again, this makes marsupial a really useful baseline for understanding what drives the evolution of brain size and all the traits that may be associated with um, being big brained. And this is some of my uh, current work as well. Um, what I'm studying at the moment most is this is this question of whether the crawl to the pouch may make marsupials somehow less able to adapt to changing environments. And I'm using the skull for this because it's a really a uh, very versatile, very functional part of the body. It has to feed the animal, it holds the brain, it has to has a lot of sensory systems. So we can ask whether these skulls show any kind of adaptation to local conditions within a species. And I do this by using a technique calling, called geometric morphometrics, which is basically placing these little balls on individual skulls and then analyzing how the relative position of these little balls changes um, across the sample. I've done this in a number of species now and I'm still putting a lot of effort into finding new species to do this with, but when we look at wombats, koalas, quolls and antichinases, uh, we get a very definite signature 
of there being a lot of shape variation inside of the skull, suggesting that these animals are very much capable of changing their most functional part of their body according to local conditions. Um, I want to show you particularly this contrast of two very differently shaped southern hairy nose wombats. So these are part of the same species, but you can see that on the left and on the right, the, the cheekbone area is totally different. And that suggests that the bones, uh, the muscles operating the jaw have very different biomechanical properties. So very clearly there is some adaptation going on inside of marsupials. Wrapping this up, I just want to say that I hope I'm convincing you that marsupials are neither primitive nor particularly small brained and definitely not incompetent at adapting to prevailing environmental conditions. There may be some other reasons why marsupials are sometimes less diverse in some aspects such as the limb and the skull. Um, and they actually hold the key to understanding mammals as a whole, where mammals came from, what determines the diversity of brain evolution and how mammals can adapt as well. And what I want to leave you with is less to do with my research, but I'm hoping to convince you that marsupials are a really, really important part of the tree of life and that Australia has the best opportunity at studying them. There are some in South America, but they're not quite as diverse as the ones we have here. Um, unfortunately, Australia has the worst record of mammal extinctions in the world, and we currently don't necessarily have a government that looks after these species that are disappearing at a very rapid rate. So no uh, ability to adapt can protect a species from the onslaught that currently happens by climate change and environmental change. So I want you to bear this in mind as I leave you with some acknowledgements, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, Vera. That was fascinating and uh, not boring at all. Um, we're starting to receive a few questions from the audience, but I'd like to encourage a few more. Um, any we can't get to, Vera will come back to you directly after the lecture. So to get the discussion started, um, and I wouldn't be forgiven by my two kids if I didn't ask, do all marsupials have a pouch? They don't all have a pouch. So marsupials in Latin literally means pouched animals and most marsupials do have a pouch, but there are quite a few that only have like a teat field. So they have like a mammary area where the young attach to, for example, the carnivorous marsupials, the so-called desuromorphs, they have an open pouch area or don't have a pouch area at all. And um, there are also some marsupials with forward facing and backward facing pouches. So the pouch is actually really quite a flexible thing. And to make things worse, female echidnas also temporarily display a pouch when they have their babies. So yeah, pouches are not just the, the domain of marsupials at all. Amazing. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit more about how marsupials got to Australia? This is a really interesting, thank you, that's a really interesting question because marsupials are literally not actually from here. When we look at early marsupial evolution, which happened during sort of the times that dinosaurs were really just flourishing and, and doing very well, uh, sort of 125-ish million years ago, the first fossils are found in the Northern Hemisphere where they're now extinct. So we have some fossils from China, we have some from Mongolia and some from North America. Um, the Europeans and Asians and North Americans are still fighting over where exactly marsupials come from, but we know that they originated in the north, moved south, then went extinct in the north and pretty much did this whole uh, walk around the earth to get to Australia. Now they're moving into New Guinea, so in maybe 10 million years they might be back in China. Wow. <laughs> So we have a question from uh, Bob on the teams. Uh, any comments on how bandicoots fit into um, um, yeah, this? Yeah, bandicoots are something really interesting because they, well, they have this backwards facing pouch for starters and they have a really strange way of reproducing, of being born. They are probably the least climbing marsupial out of all of them. So when 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 they're born, so when baby bandicoots are born, they kind of get dropped into the teat area um, in, in what's been described as a column of mucus and then they attach without a lot of climbing. So I've done a little bit of research into whether marsupials maybe also buck the trend of 
how their skeleton develops, but I haven't had the right sample sizes for that yet. But yeah, bandicoots are really fascinating. They also have a kneecap as opposed to everything else among marsupials, which is also just so random. <laughs> um. I think you've probably answered it, but if you have any more comments on why scientists haven't noticed earlier that marsupial brains are not that small. It's I think partly that they noticed very early. I mean, this paper from 1837, which was written by Richard Owen, already notes that marsupials are born at a stage where there's virtually no brain in the head of marsupials. And it's true that they seem to have the basic circuits to crawl into the pouch, but that's really all and the whole brain grows afterwards. And there's just been this foregone conclusion that marsupials for that reason are literally retards of the mammal kingdom, which is just a horrible, horrible way of thinking about it, actually. Um, and then the fact that the Virginia opossum is the only marsupial that has made it back into North America. So the only marsupial we find in Northern America up to the Canadian border is um, the Virginia opossum and that thing has a big aggressive looking skull with a really small brain case and that's what people have been using as a model organism for marsupials as a whole and I think that's really done a lot of damage to the reputation of marsupials. Yeah. So we've got another question that's come through on the Teams platform. Um, someone has asked what your favourite marsupial is and oh. why? <laughs> <gasps> What's my favourite marsupial? Probably the marsupial mole because the marsupial mole defies the laws of evolutionary gravity in so many ways. It, it's got a skeleton. I've just looked at a CT scan of it recently again. It looks like it's someone took it and rammed it into a wall and scrunched it and then threw it back to evolve. It's just, it's got no eyes. It's got really strange teeth. It's got a skull that's really weird. Its brain is squished. Its skeleton has huge claws. It's got bizarre hind limbs like we should really study everything about the marsupial mole to understand how marsupial diversity actually works. <laughs> and last question, um, how how long do marsupials live for? Is there an average like? Yeah, um, no, they are. They don't differ from placental mammals in their longevity overall. So smaller species live shorter than uh, larger species, for example. Um, I know that I was really surprised to find out that these little donuts, which are like the size of a mouse, they're carnivorous and they can live up to four years in captivity, which is really not what I expected from such a small mammal. But they they live between uh, yeah, a year, some species, some very large species like the quoll, they actually have males that die after mating once a year. So that is a very, very short lived species. But otherwise, they just follow the trend of when you're a large animal, you're, you live maybe for 15 years or 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't know the exact numbers. And I think we've just got a, a, a final question that's come through on the Teams platform. Why are there so many marsupials in Australia? Oh, that is the holy grail question. I'm looking forward to one day writing a nature paper about this. <laughs> there are many different reasons why. One of, one of the reasons is that marsupials seem to have evolved by themselves in Australia for at least the last 40 million years. There's still a bit of a debate if marsupials came to Australia with placental mammals as well, but it's possible that they didn't. We're not quite sure on this. And so they had this continent that sort of separated from all other land masses for 60 to 40 million years and just there was this ability of marsupials to just occupy every single niche, every every habitat inside of Australia and that has probably made them so incredibly diverse as opposed to South America where there was a lot of other mammals and other vertebrates already there. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Thank you. Vera really appreciated it. I'd like to thank our audience for all your questions, input and interest in the event. Remember you can watch this session again on the Flinders YouTube channel or our Flinders University Meet the Minds webpage where you can also re register to receive notifications of our future events. Thanks once again uh, Vera and everyone have a great day.